the mighty and resilient Merrimack River, carving through the communities of our great region. My name is Linda Lorden, proud president of Merrimack County Savings Bank. And like the river that serves as our namesake, we're a constant yet ever-changing presence. Because to us, it's bigger than banking. It's about powering communities and putting people first. It's about knowing where you came from and where you're going. That's Merrimack style. Visit us at themerrimack.com. Are you intentional about action? Welcome to Paper Napkin Wisdom, where we share pearls of wisdom shared by some of the world's top entrepreneurs, leaders, and difference makers. Here's your host, Govin J. Raman. Hi, my name is Govin J. Raman. This is episode number 155 of Paper Napkin Wisdom. I am thrilled that you joined me here today. If this is your first episode, don't forget to subscribe by going on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, and just search Paper Napkin Wisdom and hit subscribe. There are 154 other episodes there for you. And also, if this is your first time, don't forget to also subscribe to Take Action, which is the other podcast, short podcast, five minutes at a time. Today, we're talking about making action your default. We've got a great, young, dynamic entrepreneur. His name is John Henry. Let's listen in on my conversation with John Henry, who's a 23-year-old entrepreneur. He's exited several companies. He's also got a venture capital firm in Harlem, John Henry. John, welcome to Paper Napkin Wisdom. I'm excited to have you here today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I am looking forward to this chat. Yeah, me too. So uh, you shared an interesting paper napkin and it's sort of like a little mantra for me. So I love it. Can you share it and read it out loud to everybody listening? Yes. My paper napkin says default to action. So why did you choose that to share with me today? Why is that important? Uh, well, uh, depending on what day you catch me, it would have been a different nugget. Uh, but today, that's as I looked at your email and your call to action to, you know, you prompted me to write something small and actionable on the napkin. I thought, I thought that the nugget that I wanted to leave people with most is just a very simple idea to act to just make that your default mode. And you'll be surprised what you can build uh, if day in, day out, you default to action. Yeah, I think that the the default for most people, uh, even for most entrepreneurs, is to wait, right? Not, yeah. not to act. Yeah, and I'm of two minds about it because now that I'm, I'm engaged in business with some folks that I consider pretty high caliber and, and are maybe four or five generations deep into their, you know, their family businesses and so forth. Uh, they've established a different type of temperament altogether and they prefer actually not to default to action and they use patience as a mechanism to kind of suss a deal out and so forth. But, but then I, I think of that and one thing that becomes clear to me is you got to be true to where you are in your stage right now. And my stage, being a child of immigrant parents and, you know, build, being scrappy and building it up from the bottom up is, is exactly that. It's scrappy, it's hustle. And so um, that's, that's exactly right, the fault to action. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. It's also interesting what you said about different stages and being authentic to that stage because, you know, I think a lot of people have a hard time doing business overseas, especially in Asia, Southeast Asia and other places like that sure. because – there's so much generational wealth there. And I remember having a conversation with somebody who is a self-made entrepreneur in the environment. And he said, you know, we want to hustle, we want to create, but that's not the way generational wealth looks at it. Generational wealth has the money, they have the time, and everybody's coming in to try and take it away from them. Exactly. So they've got patience, uh, but we're, we're looking to create and that's where your biased action comes from. And like my mom tells me, you need every type of person in this world for the world to go around, you know? And so for every person who uh, has been, was fortunate enough to step into generational wealth, you have five or 10 hustlers like us trying to build it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So is this something that you've always done? Have you always defaulted to action or is it something that you had to learn? Uh, you that's know, a good question. By example. Uh, and I think that as I take a look back, that's, that's kind of been my, my normal state of being. And um, interestingly enough, I was involved in, in some study uh, that attempted to 
I attempted to identify if entrepreneurship or entrepreneurism or whatever you want to call it, if it's genetic or not. And it turns out that at least 33% uh, of our, your tendency to be an entrepreneur is indeed genetic. And in, in fact, it's traced back to a particular gene. It's, it's the dopamine receptor gene, which is just fancy talk for it's that gene that kind of uh, makes you prone to crave a thrill, you know, whether it's a roller coaster or, or whatever. I guess we take it out by doing business. Um, and so anyhow, so that's, that's an, I think that was a fascinating point that I discovered is that a, a decent chunk of our genetic makeup determines our predisposition to be an entrepreneur, but then also B it's not deterministic. Uh, and so while I've always, you know, kind of had that starter attitude, um, I've met some reluctant entrepreneurs, we call them as well, who've been successful. Yeah. But you, you know, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, that bias you know, that default to action that you just talked about can also be a problem for us, right? Because we're not respecting yeah. the stage that we're at. Sure. You know, so, so you know, that dopamine, that, that addiction to dopamine causes us to break stuff that doesn't need to be broken at times. Yeah. And you know what? It's, it's funny because for the listeners out there, take it with a grain of salt because there have been many times where I've defaulted to action and then, I, you know, I thought about it. Uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't have sent that email in that way, or maybe I shouldn't have acted as quickly on that deal uh, as I wanted to. Uh, be- and this is going back to your point about stages and so forth. This is where my older, more seasoned peers will tell me, John, time does a deal, you know, uh, suss it out, wait, and so forth. Uh, but part of me believes that that's okay anyways, because, uh, you know, the sooner you can make your mistakes and learn and so forth, this is my current truth at the moment is I like to act really fast because if you don't do something quickly, the longer it takes for something to get done, the more excuses you'll have not to do it. Yeah. And, and I'm a big believer in make it bad and make it better. In fact, you know, that's sort of like one of our things at Paper Napkin Wisdom. We say, make it bad and make it better. And you're saying that, right? I mean, like you can make it bad. You can send the wrong email and it's not fatal. You know, it's not fatal. It's not fatal as, as long as it's authentically you. That's it. That's right. The, the game. So give me an example of how you learned that the default needs to be to action. Like where, what was one of the first times you learned, Hey, you know what, when I just do it, it works out. Yeah. I think that, uh, I think that ends up taking me back to when I started my first company, maybe four or five years ago now. Uh, and for just for some context for the audience, I, as I mentioned, come from an immigrant family. My parents are from the Dominican Republic uh, always grew up relatively poor, but in a family of good values, and they kept us safe. Um, and although my parents instilled into me a value that whatever job you're doing, you do it really well. So my mom was a custodian, and my father was a, a presser to dry cleaner, uh, but they did their work with pride. And so when I was in school studying uh, actually jazz, and I wanted to be a jazz musician, um, I was also working as a doorman to kind of help make ends meet. And True to my parents' teachings, you know, I was the best damn doorman that you could find. You know, I took a lot of pride in it. And I, you know, I learned your kids' names and your pets' names and your names. And I would have all your packages, preferences ready and so forth when you walked in. Um, And anyhow, to kind of fast track, there was one resident in particular who offered me a business opportunity. He said, John, you seem like a smart kid. Why don't I offer you access to, you know, a, a business opportunity? So he... He made his money by having a chain of dry cleaners. He had 18 dry cleaners. And he quite simply offered me access to his dry cleaner at wholesale rates um, without me having wholesale volume. And all I needed to do was convince someone to give me their clothes. I bring it to him uh, and I make the spread. So for instance, this sweater that I have on, it would charge, it would cost me $6 as a regular customer. He would charge me $2. So I would make four, four bucks on the piece. And I thought, you know what? The margins seem pretty good. Like, let, let me start getting this going. And to answer your question, though, when was the first time that it occurred to me? It was in those very early days of that company, uh, which ended up growing quite quickly. And we expanded uh, and eventually serviced film and television productions. And the company was eventually acquired. So we did well. But all of that came from literally uh, this book that I always carry around uh, and just writing down one task after the other, after the other. And whenever I was feeling you know, doubtful or hesitant, 
I would default right back to that notebook and just aspire to check another thing off the list. That's amazing. And you know, you know uh, what I think is really amazing. And, and, and I, I, I do this as a little bit of a test. I have this out on my desk every single day and it's my, my old school, I call it the simple, the simple planner. And, and the simple planner is, is like this piece of paper. It, it's just eight and a half by 11, three ring binder, very unsexy. And you did the same thing. You just had a piece of paper and you know, one of the defaults to action that we have, I think in that entrepreneur DNA is to write stuff down, not type stuff out, but write stuff down and then yeah. cross it out as we yeah. go. Right. Yeah. I see a lot of entrepreneurs that I respect and are buddies of mine post-it notes right on their, on their MacBook and they just write down every single day what they want to do. And there's something about the physicality of actually writing it down and checking it off that for me just feel, gives allows me the space to celebrate a small win, you know? That's what my co-founder always called it. He says, John, we got to celebrate small wins. Even something like, dude, I followed up. I'll say, fuck yeah, that's awesome. Next one, boom, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. And as a result, it, it's, easy, it's pretty easy for me to be stoked on life, like pretty much all day long, regardless of what's happening, if you just celebrate small wins. Yeah, because you're crossing stuff out. And then it's not just one day, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. you know, one day you start, a, you, you crack the spine of that new notebook, and then it's the first page. But hey, guess what? Two days in, you got, you know, two pages. And then yeah. 10 days in, you got 10 pages. And that actually looks like something. One page doesn't look like anything. But 10 yeah. days in, it starts to look like something, and you're making progress. I'll share something cool. Uh, just, just a couple of weeks ago, I was going through my old stuff in my apartment. And I found a box and, and I pulled out my old notebook that I had actually used when I was starting my first company. Now I'm on number three. And I was flipping through the pages, reading all the checklists. And it was, it was fascinating because the memories and the, the images in my mind came back so clearly. And it was almost like watching uh, the company unfold from day one on. Uh, in the form of to-do lists and I would just something simple like get business card design this you know put up a blog and so forth and it, it's just fascinating to see what that all turned into so think about it like that right I mean think about all that stuff that you said it's all about you know you're talking about default to action default to action all of these things are actions that you can use yep. to build more momentum right so that you, yep. so you're building more speed you're getting more done you're making more progress it's just going faster and faster and faster and and isn't that what scale really is? It's like taking this lever, moving it this much, but seeing the mountain jump up. Exactly. Right? And, and so th think about the other productivity hacks, if you want to call it. I mean, that's the trendy term, right? Hacks. I, I just think that th these are systems and process that people use to be scalable with their time. Because time yeah. is the one thing we all have that's absolutely equal. Yeah. You know, the, the, the billionaire entrepreneurs out there and us, we have the same amount of time in a day. So what, how, how else do you use that default to action? Where does it come out? Number one, you've got that list. It's a written list. That you yep. work through. What, what are the other things that you're doing? Yep. Uh, I, I try to keep my, my setup pretty simple. Um, and I think that, I think that uh, as I've encountered different entrepreneurs who have different natural strengths, I've realized that you should just be doubling down on what you're good at. So for instance, my technical co-founder, um, he is extremely process oriented and driven. And because he's also technical, he actually develops for himself like these little widgets that he can pop his to-dos into and like they'll pop up all over the screen. And like, it's, it's a pretty sophisticated process he has going on and that works for him. Whereas for me, I keep it super simple and I just, I'm an early bird, so I try and wake up as early as I can, um, which, you know, is not anything like 4 or 5 a.m. I try to make it 6.30 a.m. Um, and what I try to do every day is the night before, I'll write down my to-do list, actually, the night before. And then when I wake up, I prioritize it. And I make sure that the most absolutely pressing uh, things or and, or and or not necessarily pressing, but the tasks that will yield the biggest results uh, for me personally. Um, I try to make sure that I'm spending my time on those first. And sometimes they're unsexy things. Like the, the past couple of weeks, I've been dealing with uh, complicated tax issues. 
And so like, I'd actually rather go and, and do a blog post and do a speaking engagement and look all cool on social media. Uh, but you know, sometimes you got to uh, get down to brass tacks and do taxes. But anyways, to your question, I keep it really simple. I try and wake up as early as I can. I try to make sure that uh, I try to catch myself when I'm being unfocused. And that happens to me many times throughout the day. What does that uh, look like? That looks like opening up my browser and typing an F enter and Facebook pops up. And, you know, it's, it's strange because Facebook's kind of becoming the new TV, you know? And I find myself like, not even that I have a notification that I was even drawn to Facebook, but I'll just kind of go there. That's where my mind goes when I'm just being kind of idle. When you're uh, flicking channels, right? Yeah. Yeah. So try and keep, stay away from that. And I try and stay away from unnecessary meetings. Um, I find that can be a big time drain um, between commuting there and so forth. So, yeah, man, I, I think uh, my my uh, processes are pretty simple. That notebook is staying up, uh, waking up early and working on important things. So let's talk about waking up early. One of the first things you did when you said waking up early, I don't wake up like at 4.30 or 5 o'clock or anything like that. I wake up at 6.30. And I think this is a fundamental thing that a lot of people don't get. Waking up early is just waking up earlier than everybody else around you. Right. right? Like, how, how old are you, John? I'm 23. Yeah, so you're 23. You don't have a 10-year-old that walks into your room at, 10, at 6 o'clock in the morning. No, thankfully, right? at the moment. <laughs> right? That would be pretty odd. You know, some explaining to do if you have a 10-year-old doing that. <laughs> but, you know, and, and I think that what a lot of people, entrepreneurs, miss is that it's just being up earlier than everyone else around you so sure. that you have your time, right? That's it. That, that time is your time. That time is your time. And uh, for me personally, I don't know if I've always been an old soul or what have, or maybe it's influence of my parents, but I really enjoy waking up in the morning and reading the paper. Um, and I actually read, I read the physical paper. I read the New York Times and I read the Economist and I'm, in, I'm beginning to incorporate the Financial Times. Um, and I you'll be surprised what you can recall every day as you read these things, current events. You don't necessarily have to remember these facts or write them down. If you just keep yourself privy to what's going on, uh, at least for me as a guy who's always looking for different opportunities and I'm investing and so forth, different things come up in conversation and I can put things together. And uh, the more access to information that you're, well, we all have access to information, but the more quality information that you're ingesting, uh, I think it increases the quality of your output as well. And how much is that is to you in your mind? Because I have a theory that, that exponential entrepreneurs actually spend deliberate time practicing focus. And they may not call it practicing focus, sure. but I call it practicing focus, right? Because you can't summon the kind of focus, this wild focus that comes into a meeting where you have to drive a negotiation forward and get something done and just stay there on that point until you get it done. You can't summon that kind of focus unless you practice it. Do you think that you're practicing focus when you do that? So that, you know, when you're reading, when you're collecting that information, when you're, it, it, you're, you're, you could be doing a million different things, including Facebook, but you're choosing to do this and sounding out everything else. Like you're, you're, it's not so much that you're zoned in on this, but you're zoned out of everything else. Yeah, no, uh, I've never actually uh, a heard of that term and thus B have never thought about it actively, but that's exactly what it is. Um, and I also, I often like to think about focus as a muscle that you flex. Uh, and to your point, when it comes down to showtime, if you haven't been training, then uh, you're not going to perform. And so one of the things I read in a book a long time ago, and I even forgot what book it was, but it, it pointed out uh, the interesting fact that our mind as a crutch becomes tired, our brains become tired when we're dealing with things that we don't want to deal with. And the example that it had illustrated was, do you remember when you were in high school and you're doing your homework and you're sleepy and you're tired? And then your buddy calls you and says, hey, let's go out to a party. And then all of a sudden you get that energy. It's not really that you got more energy from that bit of information, but rather your mind kind of wanes when it's doing things it doesn't want to be doing. And so um, to your point, yes, absolutely. Practicing focus and flexing it. And you can sustain it for longer periods of time that way. So, and, and that's, I think that's really important. I think that one of the things that's really also interesting about this is that if you're thinking about the default to action, it, it, it's... If people would say, well, hey, reading the paper is not a default to action. But when you talk about it as being like training of focus, it really is a default to action. It's, in yeah. fact, it's the most active thing that you could do. 
absolutely. And I mean, even beyond, even beyond the focus part for me, um, because of now I mentioned a couple of times, uh, I have two ventures going on at the moment. And in one of those, I have some very senior partners who are very, uh, and aside from being very experienced, they're very privy to what goes on all over the world. Uh, and for me, that reading is an action that uh, for me is increasingly important. And when I read a year ago or two years ago that Warren Buffett reads six hours a day, I was having a, a talk with my portfolio CEOs. Right now I'm at uh, an incubator where we invest in companies. And we had the discussion that some people think that Warren Buffett can afford to re- spend six hours a day reading because he's already rich. And we arrived at the conclusion that he's probably rich because he reads that much and you get access to all the information. Yeah, he gets access to the information. But beyond that, think of how focused this guy is. That in oh. the middle of the day, he can drown everything out and focus on this for six hours. Would you like to be in a negotiation with this guy? Hell yeah. Yeah, I mean, this guy, this guy's going to, this guy's going to, take that focus muscle and beat you with it. Exactly. Right. So I, I think that's fascinating. So when you, when you, when you think about it, think about your life before you were deliberate about this stuff, intentional about this stuff yeah. now. And I, I'm like you, um, child of immigrants, my, my parents, it, it's, you know, it's an immigrant story. I think that every single child of immigrants gets told, doesn't matter what you do, just be the best at it. Yeah. Like be, you could be a toilet cleaner, but just be yeah. the best toilet cleaner in the world. Yeah. Not in the block, in the world. Yeah. It's that spirit. Right. And that's, that's like, that's, that's a, it's an immigrant spirit. And I think that's an amazing thing. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, think about your life before you were intentional about this default to action and then after. That's, uh, that's a fascinating question. Uh, I've never considered it. Um, to your earlier question, I believe I've always had a degree of that in me innately, but I became very intentional about it. Probably when I was 17 and I had decided that I was going to be, to your point, the world's best jazz musician. Not the best in my neighborhood, but the world's best. And my days were literally eight hours a day, uh, all day, practicing, just in silence, just practicing. And I'm talking not fun stuff, like not playing songs, but like going through scales and music theory and so forth. And I was just so intense about it. Uh, And that's how I've become about everything that I do. Uh, And before that, maybe it wasn't like that. And um, for me personally, although there's a lot of sacrifice that comes with that intensity and that focus, uh, I much prefer this kind of life that I have now. Yeah. And, and intention is a really big part of that, right? I mean, intention is a big part of that default to action. You, you, you don't do that by accident. Nope. Right. So what is, what is the intention building exercise of your day look like or of the hour or of the, how do you do it? Like how, what does it look like for you? I think at this point, it's not something that I consciously do anymore. I, think I, I remember there, was, there were times where I sat down with my little black book. I, just wrote the word, I wrote the word greatness over and over for maybe like 20, 30 pages. And it's like, since I've, since I, uh, since I've read a book from an author named Ayn Rand, who has some people are mixed about her like very intense ideologies but she just kind of awoke me to the power that comes from the individual and i fell in love with this whole idea of totally uh reaching the pinnacle of your human potential right so i want to be everything that i can be and then the question is well what can you be and you can only find out the more effort you put in and so um in those early days, that looked like just writing it a lot and thinking it a lot and spending all my time on it. And now it's kind of my, my autopilot mode where I am constantly driven on just about every moment of every day to be more and, and almost to a fault, almost to a fault. For instance, if I'm not being productive, I feel guilty. You know, if I'm hanging out, I feel, you know, I feel guilty when I'm not being productive. And maybe that's, again, that's probably borderline unhealthy, but that's kind of the life and the intensity that I've created for myself. uh, And I fucking love it. (laughs) And it, and I'd rather, um, I'd rather be this way than not. Way to be now? 
I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you know another way to be now? Like, could you be something else? I not at this point. Yeah. So, so again, if, if, for people listening, if you if you think back to it, there's a step that John's talking about is he's built his mindset. His mindset, his secret weapon is is unbelievable right now. And he said something that most people would say, holy crap, that's crazy. You wrote, you know, what, what was the word that you wrote again? It was greatness. Greatness. You wrote greatness on 20 with pages. With a capital G. <laughs> with a capital G, right? Um, on 20 pages. I relate to that. You know, uh, every morning when I go on a walk for 30, 40 minutes, I say the same word over and over and over again. Nice. Uh, and so, and I've been doing that for years. Wow. So I, I totally get this obsession with mindset. And, and I think that one of the things that people need to, to, to cue in on this is that this doesn't happen by accident. This happens because you're just thinking about it all the time, all the time. And that's the first default. The, the default, the first default is in thought. That's it. And I'm glad that you brought attention to the fact that uh, the word that you used was the, it was a mindset that was built. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, you know, along with these great habits that, that I have, there are some areas in my life where I have poor habits. And as I look back, as I face those poor habits and I look back, I realize, oh, man, those habits were also built. And, and so we, we all act on autopilot based in accordance with what we, what habits we've built and cultivated over a long period of time. Uh, and the great, the great thing is that habits can be reversed and new habits can be learned. Um, but in the initial periods, uh, it takes a lot of conscious effort and I liken it. I always liken the mind to a garden. Uh, unfortunately, weeds, like bad habits, grow much faster than roses, uh, and they actually will destroy everything around them. Uh, and so you have to be a fervent keeper of your mind and and just tend to them and make sure that you're harvesting good thoughts and so forth. And a, a book that I read that went a long way for me and that I actually read every single day um, for a good year and a half, now I read it maybe once every few months, it's called As a Man Thinketh by James Allen would highly recommend that book. It's 40 pages. You can you know, read it in an afternoon, but you can study it for a lifetime. Actually I haven't read that one. Yeah. Uh, when you, when you started talking about it, I thought you were going to say think and grow rich by Napoleon Hill, which that's is another, that's another cornerstone. One. Which, which is my, which is my book that I read probably every month. Awesome. So you're, have you, are you into Bob Proctor and Night, Nightingale and all a little that? bit okay. more, more Napoleon, because yeah. that's the foundation a lot of, of a lot of that thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. That's, that's amazing. Hey, you know, our time today is done, John, uh, but I think the conversation went really fast. I'd love to have you back again at some time. What do you think? Yeah, I would, I would love it, man. I, I get a great energy from you. I hope that someday soon we get to connect in person. Where, where are you based out of? I'm in Canada. Oh, okay, cool. Awesome, man. Hey, John, what a great conversation. Thanks for that. You know, it's amazing how many entrepreneurs, budding, seasoned entrepreneurs can just find themselves at a standstill because they're just not taking action. They're not taking action and not making action their default. So many times people are just stuck in not moving forward because of fear, because of a need to get more data, because a need to analyze, and that just gets them stuck. I know I've been there. I know I've been there. It's, it's happened to me before where I have just been stuck and it's especially horrible because it happens at these times when I really need to be moving forward, when I really need to be making a lot of progress, when the urgency is there, I know I don't have options, I know I don't have time, and I am stuck. And why has that happened? Maybe fear, maybe it's a fear of failure, but maybe it's a fear of success. But either way, if you make bias, your bias towards action, your default towards action, you'll be surprised with what you can do. You'll be surprised with what you can build. And you know the motto that I say on this show very often, make it bad and make it better. Just make it. And that's what this is all about, making it happen. And that's what led John to his first wholesale opportunity. And it was just a dry cleaning opportunity when he was a doorman, right? When he did that, he ended up building a company that was just out of being a doorman and, and a dry clean wholesale opportunity and turned it into a saleable company. 
cleaning, dry cleaning services to companies uh, that run production for famous TV shows like Boardwalk Empire and Law and & Order and many more. Incredible. And think about the routines that John follows to stay centered, to stay on target. Before going to sleep, he writes out his to-do list for the next day, prioritizing it on what needs to yield the biggest results instead of the things that he finds most fun. And then he catches himself winning by finishing that list. Getting rid of Facebook. Facebook is the new TV. And that distraction just sends him down a spiral. So getting rid of Facebook and turning away from that is really great for him. He also spends time, instead of distraction on an electronics, he spends time reading in the morning. Again, practicing focus. John is looking at focus like a muscle. You've heard on this show, practice focus. And John views the fact that he has to work out his focus muscle. Becoming intentional about his focus is a hard, huge part of his motto. Are you prepared to be so intentional about greatness that you would write greatness over and over and over in your book hundreds of times? Every single day when I go for my walk, I remind myself that I am unstoppable. What do you do every single day to put yourself in a position for success? What would you do if you defaulted by actioning? And how would that improve your default state? How would that improve your business? Think about it. I'd love to hear what you think about this episode or any of the others. Remember, this was Paper Napkin Wisdom, episode number 155. If this is your first time here, thank you for coming. Please subscribe. There's 154 other episodes that are exciting and amazing entrepreneurial content just like this. If you like Paper Napkin Wisdom, you're going to love the other podcasts we have. It's called Take Action. Search it on Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Add it, and it's a short five-minute podcast, much in the same spirit as Paper Napkin Wisdom. Also, don't forget to head over to Amazon and pick up Paper Napkin Wisdom, the five-step guide for life and business success. My name is Govan J. Raman. This was Paper Napkin Wisdom. Make it a great day. (laughs) 